Hopefully. Oh man, this is like a pain in the ass. Honestly, volunteering for like, you know, like positions is really, like, you don't realize how annoying, like, the little stuff it adds up. Yeah. I'm just going to check the code. That's fine. Just to check the audio code. We'll start in a couple of minutes. Okay, hey guys, can you hear me at the back? It's all with this, all good? Okay, so my name is Paul, I'm one of the third year medical students. Uh, I'm currently placed at Alfred at the moment. Um, so I'll be going through cardiology revision. Uh, so this is mainly first year content, and just a warning, I'm not going to ex focus much on explaining the details of certain things. I'll be more focusing on what you should know, and if you don't know it, go learn it. Does it make sense? And if uh, I think most of the stuff that I want you to know will be on the slides, they'll either be highlighted or bolded, okay? The key details. At this point in time, you really want to cut your losses and not try to rote memorize everything, but no, other way around. You want to rote memorize everything and not try to understand anything anymore. Because <laughs> you have very little time, you have so much content to learn. Uh, cardiology, Okay, so this is a mark breakdown from the last two years, the VIA breakdown, because there's, no cardi there's no cardiology technically on the end of the year. Uh, so the main things that you can be tested for in cardiology will be the anatomy, the physiology, the clinical skills, and the pharmacology. I think someone else is covering pharmacology, so I'm not covering it. I'm 100% sure about that, though. Is that right? No one else is covering pharmacology. Oh, crap. Okay. No worries then. Okay. Okay. Um, Clinical skills, uh, it will just be science and such, which you should be able to pick up relatively easy. So just go through a cardio exam and be like, oh, this sign is for this. If I'm asking for this question, this is what I'm looking for. Does it sort of make sense? And physiology, there's a lot of stuff in physiology they can ask you. And anatomy, they tend to like asking anatomy questions as well. Any questions so far? Okay. So we'll start with the embryology. Relatively speaking, compared to the other areas, this is really, really low yield. So I'll just be explaining in a very, very simple way of what happens to the heart, because I'm pretty sure you didn't pick it up the first time, like I did. So the, the concepts you want to get through your head is the heart is originally a single tube. The single tube rotates, uh, and then it becomes the ventricle and the atrium, the atrium and the ventricles. And then between in the middle of these four areas, you get this endocardial dorsal endocardial cushion that forms. Then you get the atrial septa uh, the atria septa forms, which splits the two atria, and you have the ventricle septa, which forms, which splits the ventricles, and the valves form between the atria and the ventricles. And then you want to know about embryonic circulation, and you want to know about remnant structures. Those two are probably the highest yield you probably get from embryology. This rote memorizing that will probably get you pretty far. So just the gist of this, do we have a mouse? Oh, I'll just use this. It doesn't work on this, this trackpad. Yeah, don't worry. Yeah. So the gist of it is initially it's two endocardial tubes. They fuse together at around day 22 and they become the primitive heart. Yeah, that's pretty easy to get. So it becomes a single tube. Um, 
the blood flows from inferior to superior, but you know how in embryology everything's worded differently, and they go it goes from the tail end to the head end, and that's called caudal to cranial, cranial. But that's about it. Uh, so you can see here the different parts of the heart. That's rotation. Different parts of the heart, and this is the bottom. This is going up to the head. Does it make sense? So you have the atria. So that you have the what will become the veins, the atria, the ventricles, something called the bulbous cortis and the trunk arteriosus, which eventually becomes the large vessels of the heart. Uh, I don't think this is too important to memorize, so I'll just move on. But just there for reference, the main main thing to take away from it is that the atria and ventricles. So the heart rotates, and it rotates in a sort of weird way. The top section of the heart, which is the ventricle part of the heart, because given the blood flowing from Blood flows from the atria to the ventricles. Blood in the embryonic heart initially flows inferior to superior. So the top part of the heart folds forward, bends a bit to the right and down. So if you sort of look at it over here, this is the top part of the heart. And it sort of folds forward, down, a bit to the right and becomes anterior to the anterior and inferior to the atria. And that's how you get the current heart in an adult human person. Does that make sense? Um, I think, and it becomes S-shaped. So it goes single tube, C-shape, S-shape. Um, so the end result is that the ventricles are anterior and inferior, atria, posterior, superior, adult heart sort of appearance. And this is just going through it, straight heart, C-shape, S-shape. And you sort of see the ventricles and atria dividing. So I'm just gonna talk about the correct view to look at the heart. So this is from the left side of the heart and this is from the front view. So you sort of see after the heart folded, it sort of looks like this, the two atria like that, the ventricles like anterior inferior to it. Does it make sense? You, from the side, you want to cut the heart through the atria and the ventricles. So you can see both the atria and the ventricles and what happens with the endocardial cushion. Okay. So at the moment, the atria is one huge like chamber and the ventricles is one huge chamber and they're just interconnected as a single tube. There's nothing different, like maybe a little bit of a thing differentiating, but nothing really separating them. Does this make sense? So just two chambers at the moment. So what happens is, so this is the, assuming we cut it through here, you get this sort of view. Yeah. And through this sort of view, the endocardial cushion Forms. So it forms, if we cut, the, if this is the adult heart, this is anterior, this is posterior, we cut it like this, the dorsal endocardial cushion forms, goes like that, it forms a pillar like that. And it sort of is sort of in between the four chambers. And that, yeah, it's called the dorsal endocardial cushion. I don't think that's too important to stress, but it might be something that might pop up. Does it make sense? Any questions? Okay, moving on. Um, so again, more pictures to illustrate how it forms anterior posterior kind of joint in the middle. We sort of see initially it was a single tube. So this is the veins, this is the atria, this is the ventricles, and this is the aortic sac that comes out. And they sort of just join like that. And then you see two holes, which is here and here. Okay, uh, so the, the this is probably more important than anything I talked about before. Is the formation of the atrial septum. So the septum grows from the superior margin of the heart, of the atria. So this is from the side view. This is looking anterior to posterior. It's anterior to posterior, this is from the side, looking from the, I think the left or right side, one or the other. Anyway, the, the I think it's from the right side. So the, the first thing that forms is something called the septum primum, septum, Septum did uh, divide stuff, primum, first thing. So the septum primum grows and gradually grows downwards to separate the two atria. Does it make sense? As it's about to close off the atria, the hole formed that before it completely closes off is called the ostium primum. Ostium is like, I think it means hole or something like that, primum first. And when it's about to completely close off the ostium primum, you know how blood needs to shunt from the right atria to the left atria in the embryonic heart? It still needs a hole there. So what forms is you get degeneration of a section of the, so you see here, this is the side view. You get degeneration of a hole of the um, septum primum and that becomes the ostium secundum. 
whereas the Austin primum is gradually being closed by the septum primum. All good? Hopefully. And then as and then when it completely forms, you get a second septum, which forms on the right atria. And it forms downwards again, and it slowly, so switch pictures, so it forms downwards and it slowly covers the ostium, it slowly covers the ostium secundum, and it forms something called the foramen ovale. So as it slowly covers this, blood, uh, blood can only shunt one way. So it can only shunt from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart. It can't shunt backwards. It acts as a sort of flutter valve. Does it make sense? So if you just get familiar with those terms, septum primum, septum secundum, ostium primum, ostium secundum, and foramen ovale, I think those five terms, you'll be on top of this and it'll be fine. But remember, shunt only right side to left side. And the septum primum acts as the valve. Okay, so the formation of the ventricular septum is a lot more simple than the atrial septum. Basically, it just grows from the bottom part of the heart towards the endocardial cushion in the middle. And as it's about to completely join, a membranous part, which comes from the great vessels, joins with it. So it's kind of hard to explain. There's a video on this I can link you guys later that explains a lot, but Overall, just, just realize that most of it just grows from the bottom of the heart and then from the great vessels, you have a spiraling septum, which comes because you... I just... Next slide. So this is to show, illustrate the spiral septum. Have you guys heard of the term transposition of the great vessels? The great vessels is basically when the septum doesn't spiral. If the septum doesn't spiral, the aorta is attached to the right ventricle as opposed to the left ventricle and vice versa. So the heart needs, you know, the, the left ventricle is posterior to the right ventricle. So as, re, and, but the aorta is initially, so the pulmonary vessels initially posterior to the aorta, but as a result, you need to swivel them around and as you sort of see here, if you cut through here, the septum is divided like this, but as it goes down, it spirals downwards. So all you have to re remember from this is ventricular septum grows upwards and joins with the spiral septation of the great vessels. Uh, so this is the time frame of the what happens in the heart. Uh, you can go into a lot more detail if you really want, but I don't think it's worth spending your time memorizing the dates and such of every single key landmark of the heart. So to quickly summarize, day 22, you see this, the heart tube, the two heart tubes become one heart. Day 28 to 28, it's spiraling. About the fourth week, the walls of the heart form and it's beating by itself. The fifth, fifth and sixth week onwards, the endocardial cushion forms and septa are forming. And seventh week onwards, valves form, pulmonary trunks, pulmonary trunks and great vessels divide. So this is probably higher yield than about as high yield as the uh, division of the uh, atrial receptor. So if you just memorize this, the, the highlighted stuff, you're pretty much on top of it. So just to quickly explain, the foramen ovale, which we talked about, is the shunting of the right bench, right atria to the left atria. So it allows blood to travel from the right atria to the left atria. In the adult, it's called the fossa ovalis. You have the ductus venosus, which shunts blood from the umbilical vein. So where is it? Ductus venosus over here shunts blood from the umbilical vein. So it bypasses the liver to join the inferior vena cava. And in the adult, it's called the ligamentum venosum. And the ductus arteriosus, which connects the two great vessels together to shunt blood from the pulmonary trunk into the aorta, is called the ligamentum arteriosum in the adult. If you just memorize that, I reckon you'll be on top of it. So changes in circulation during birth. So during in, in fetal circulation, the right atrial pressure is greater than left atrial pressure. Does that make sense? So in fetal circulation, right atrial pressure is greater than left atrial pressure. As a result, the foramen ovale is open and blood flows from the right atria to the left atria. When you are born and you take your first breath, the pressure in the lungs decreases by a lot. As a result, the left atrial pressure increases and the increases more than the right atrial pressure. When this happens, it closes the shunt and then blood flows as it normally does in an adult circulation. Uh, the thing about the increased oxygen respiration and the prostaglandins is extra. Don't worry about that too much. Uh, 
I found congenital abnormalities to be rather low yield. I can quickly go through them. They're generally very straightforward, besides tetralogy of phallet, where you might want to memorize this mnemonic, but I didn't memorize it when I was in your year, to be honest. Uh, so the, the defects are atrial septal defect. So the atrial septal doesn't form at all, or doesn't form right, yeah? It doesn't mean that there's a frame and ovale or anything. It just makes it so there's a hole in the heart. And basically, so the blood can flow from the right, the left side of the heart to the right side of the heart. Does this make sense? So there's a hole in the heart, pressure in the adult, you have <coughs> the right atria is greater than the left atria. Pre blood flows from the left atria to the right atria. Does this make sense? So pressure in the left part side of the heart is greater than the right side of the heart. There's a hole in the heart, blood flows from the left side of the heart to the right side of the heart. As a result, you get cyanosis. Patent foramen ovale is different. It's basically when the foramen ovale fails to close completely. So remember the valve we talked about? In the adult, eventually it seals off. But in some people, it doesn't seal off. It remains patent. That means that if and only if the right atrial pressure increases over the left atrial pressure, will it become open. Does that make sense? So it's usually closed because the left atrial pressure is greater than the right atrial pressure. If it switches somehow, for example, in core pulmonale, in which you get... Um, Basically, if right atrial pressure increases more than left atrial pressure, it will remain, it will open and you get blood shunting the other way around. Tetralogy of Follett uh, is the most common cause of early childhood cyanosis. It's, you can remember the four things by a mnemonic called PROOF. So you get pulmonary stenosis, so the pulmonary closing of the, uh, at the pulmonary trunk at the exit here. You have right ventricular hypertrophy. You have the overriding aorta, and you have a ventral septal defect. Beyond memorizing that, I don't think you need to know anything about the of ballot. Uh, and the, so the treatment is early surgical correction. Um, more congenital abdomenis, so your ventral septal defect, hole in the ventricles. Most common congenital cardiac defect. It's asymptomatic at birth, but it's pretty much just a hole in the ventricle. Uh, transposition of the great vessels, basically the septa didn't divide properly. As a result, uh, that's, I think that's about as much as you need to know. Patent ductus arteriosus. So remember the, the, the remember the shunt between the aorta and the pulmonary um, arteries. That basically that's still open. That's the patent ductus arteriosus, and you have congenital valvular defects. And basically, I think the most common one is the bicuspid aortic valve. But other than that, I don't think it's worth spending your time on congenital abnormalities. So uh, anatomy, worth knowing at least the basics of it. You can probably grab a few marks here and there. If they go into too much detail, don't worry too much. Most people won't get the extremely detailed stuff. Uh, so basic anatomy, four chambers, atria, ventricles, atria receive blood, ventricles eject blood. Right side receives blood from the body, ejects it into the pulmonary vessel, into the lungs. Right side, uh, left side of the heart injects into the body, receives blood from the uh, lungs. Um, in terms of the valves, you need to know this. Please memorize the valves. Um, also memorize where they are clinically as well. I think you guys have a mnemonic for that. Anyway, moving on. So tricuspid mitral valves are the two AV valves, so between the atrium and ventricles, whereas you have your aortic and pulmonary valves for the left ventricle and the right ventricle respectively. And remember which ones has three cusps, which ones have two cusps. Basically the by the mitral or the bicuspid valve has two cusps. That's about it. And also one more thing, the AV valves have called a tendine and papillary muscles which sort of stop them from rupturing. Yeah, remember that these are tense when they are closed. Coronary circulation, um, this is probably a question that comes up quite a bit, I feel. Uh, basically, the current, the way the heart is supplied is through the aortic cusps being open. So when the aortic valves are closed, the aortic cusps are open, as you can see here. Aortic valve is closed, aortic cusps are open. Blood flows back during diastole into the heart. So that means the heart is perfused during diastole, which is important to understand. If your heart is beating really, really fast, you get reduced time in diastole. And that can lead to difficulties, uh, perfusing the heart. Uh, blood returning to the atria. So there's three vessels which drain into the right atrium, which is the SVC, IVC, and the coronary sinus. Coronary sinus is the basically the vein of the heart. Uh, you got four vessels draining to the atrium, the pulmonary veins. 
to your left to your right, you have blood leaving the ventricle. So right ventricle ejecting to pulmonary trunk, divides to left and right pulmonary trunk, uh, left ventricle ejecting to aorta. This is very basic stuff. You should know this. I hope you know this. Uh, the mediastinum, know that it's divided into a superior and inferior mediastinum at the level of T45. Know that the inferior mediastinum is divided into anterior, middle, and posterior. The middle mediastinum is mainly the heart. The anterior mediastinum only has the thymus. There's a lot of stuff in the superior and the posterior mediastinum, which I don't think is worth learning, but if you really do have spare time, I put it down in the slides. Uh, things at the thoracic plane, this is worth learning. Uh, I think there's a lot, there's a few more things than just this, but these are the most important things I feel. So bifurcation of the trachea, aortic arch, pulmonary trunk bifurcation, zygous veins into the S SVC and SCV, but anyway, moving on. Ligamentum arteriosum. So, and there's a few more things here and there. Uh, borders of the heart. Um, I didn't really get this, but if you wrote memorize this, you'll be on top of things. Pretty much the most anterior part of the heart is the right ventricle. The posterior of the heart is the left atrium. The right, the right side of the heart is the right atrium. The left and inferior part is mainly the left ventricle. So if you just memorize this, that's fine. But if you understand it, that's even better. But at this point, it's, you can just sort of throw away understanding this me rote memory stuff and get away with it. Uh, the pericardium, um, this is worth learning. It's a double, it's a double layered, fi so there's a fibrous and serous pericardium. Okay, so it's a double layered sort of structure. Uh, so you have the fibrous pericardium, which envelops the heart. And then you have this sort of, uh, layer which loops back on itself and the outer layer of this is called the parietal of layer of the serous pericardium and inner layer is called the visceral layer of the serous pericardium and in between this you have something called the pericardial cavity in which pericardial fluid exists yeah so inside the pericardial cavity there's a bit of pericardial fluid to act as sort of um ma makes it easier for the heart to move inside the sac any questions so far Okay, now the, I'll talk a bit more about the visceral layer of the serous pericardium in a bit, because it's also the same as the epicardium. So pericardial sinuses, worth learning. Uh, they somehow love asking this occasionally, and I didn't really understand it, and I still don't really understand it, so I just um, looked it up. Anyway, moving on, so the transverse pericardial sinus, is basically behind the two great vessels so the aorta and the pulmonary vessels yeah so if you can stick your finger behind the aorta and the pulmonary vessels and go through that is the transverse pericardial sinus it's a continuous sinus which means it can go completely through um that's about it so it, it's sort of here and you can sort of go through the outside, other side over there and the other thing the one thing about the, peri the transverse pericardial sinus is that it can be used to clamp the aorta and the pulmonary trunk in surgery, if you really need to. Uh, in a, the oblique pericardial sinus, it's a blind end. So you stick your finger in and you can't go any further. And it's behind the left atrium. So remember how I said the most posterior part of the heart is the left atrium? It's sort of behind the heart. That's how I remember it, but in front of the pericardium. So sort of like a gap between them. Uh, arteries, veins, of the pericardium. I don't think it's worth learning it, but I, because I feel like if they ask a question, this will be very obvious what the answer would be. Anyway, moving on. Uh, arterial supply of the heart. Memorize this picture. Memorize what dominance means. This will probably come up. So dominance of the heart is determined by which coronary vessel supplies the posterior descending artery. That's pretty much it. Whichever artery supplies the posterior descending artery is the determines the dominance of the heart. The epidemiology you should also memorize because they love asking that. 70% of the time it's by the right coronary artery. 20% of the time it's by the left. 10% of the time it's a by it's both. You might hear a bit of variance in the numbers. I'm not too sure what numbers they're using at the moment, but this is what I had in my notes. So um, in terms of arteries themselves, aorta, the big one, become there's the right coronary artery, which 60% of the time it supplies the SA node. It also becomes the right marginal, posterior interview, IV and AV node. But generally just memorize the right coronary artery and what it sort of supplies. And the left coronary artery, Left coronary artery breaks into the circumflex and the anterior IV, which you do need to remember those two branches though, because they love differentiating between the circumflex and the anterior intraventricular. Okay, so of the arteries to memorize, it would be the right coronary artery, 
the circumflex artery and the anterior intravicular artery. Does it make sense? And you can sort of memorize the little details if you have extra time, but if you want to get the highest yield stuff for the least amount of time, remember that. This is just a picture showing the innovate, uh, supply of the heart. So over here we have the right coronary arteries, and over here we have the left coronaries, that's the anterior, and that's circumflex. I don't think they'll, they'll bring a picture up and like question you on it, but if they do, I guess you can sort of work out backwards what it might be. Uh, venous drainage of the heart, the gist of it is the veins of the heart drain into the coronary sinus and that drains into the right atrium. If you hear something called the Thebsian ring ever pop up as a choice, it's pretty much just the valve of the coronary sinus. They love adding that to confuse people when they're asking about valves. Um, so just to quickly summarize, great middle small cardiac valves drain into coronary sinus, coronary sinus drains into the right atrium. Heart tissue, so there's three layers. So you have the endocardium, the myocardium, and the epicardium. Technically speaking, you also have something called the subendocardial layer, but every, I just ignore it for now. I think it's too important. Uh, so the endocardium is basically the internal lining of the heart and the valves, and it can become inflamed in a condition called endocarditis. And it's made up of loose connective tissues and simple squamous epithelial tissue. I don't think you need to memorize that, but if you have spare time, go ahead. Um, the middle layer is the myocardium, makes up the biggest bulk of the heart. It is made up of the muscle of the heart, made up of cardiac muscle tissue. Yeah, and you have your, epi, uh, your epicardium. Remember how I talked about the visceral pericardium? It's pretty much the same layer. It's a thin external layer of the heart. So you have your cardiac muscle. You need to know the difference between the three cardiac, the three types of muscles, smooth muscle, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle. So cardiac muscle is striated, it forms an insidium using gap junctions, and it's involuntary. Layers of the vessels. I don't think you need to know this in detail. If you need to know anything, it'll probably be the endothelium and maybe the tunica media. But the gist of it is that you have your tunica adventitia, the outermost layer, made up of collagen, very elastic, you have your tunica media, which acts as a middle layer, in which is smooth muscle. And you have your tunica intermode, which is the innermost layer. And it's basically one of the largest um, endocrine organs in the body. And it secretes a lot of stuff. So the arterial vessels, at least know the progression of them. So arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, veins, and then heart. And then it starts again. So the biggest vessels is the elastic or the large arteries. It acts as pressure reservoirs. So what that means is that it holds blood in them and pushes it along. Does it make sense? I hope that makes sense. Uh, you have your muscular part arteries, which help distribute and control the flow of the blood. So the reason why they have, they're called muscular parts is they can constrict and increase or decrease the perfusion of certain areas of the body, depending on the hormones that act in it and the sympathetic nervous system, sympathetic and parasympathetic, not parasympathetic, sympathetic nervous system that acts in them. The arterioles, you, the key point to remember the arterioles is they are the resistance vessels of the heart. Here, you have the largest fall in pressure of, yeah, the largest fall in pressure. I'll show you on the next slide. And it's only the sympathetic innervation. Uh, then after that, you have capillaries in which you get diffusion and of nutrients and absorption of waste and such like that. So as you can see here, this is this is the mean arterial pressure, and you get the largest drop inside the arterioles. This is probably something that they love asking, and something I recommend that you memorize. So this is just talking about the pressure reservoir of the heart and how the blood flow is intermittent, and how the how the heart continue doesn't pump continuously, but the flow throughout the body is continuous. And the gist of it is that because the elastic arteries stretch and they continuously squeeze during diastole, so when the heart is relaxing and continuously push the blood. But I don't think it's a very high yield point to know about. Uh, types of capillaries, there's continuous, fenestrated, sinusoidal. Continuous is the hardest, very controlled barrier. Fenestrated, pores in the membrane, dissolves a bit of stuff here and there. Sinusoidal, lets a lot of stuff through. Uh, and the examples of stuff that's found in is at the very bottom. If you have spare time, um, it might be worth going through that as well. But overall, I don't think this is worth spending much time on. Autonomic innovation of the heart. Worth learning, definitely worth learning. Sym the sympathetic innovation of the heart is from the sympathetic chain ganglion. 
uh, you have fibers to the SA node and the AB node, and this increases the heart rate. You have fibers to sympathetic fibers to the ventricular muscles, and this increases inotropy. Inotropy is also known as the contractility of the heart. And also, this bit of innovation releases noradrenaline, which acts on beta one and adrenal receptors. But that's a different lecture. Uh, but parasympathetic is different from the sympathetic. It comes from the vagus nerve. But the key thing is that the parasympathetic only supplies the SA node and the AV node, and it only decreases heart rate. It doesn't affect the contractility of the heart. And later, I'll talk about what supplies the blood vessels. And you realize the difference between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic innervation to the cardiovascular system. But just a bit, parasympathetic system only supplies the SA and AV node. Sympathetic supplies a lot of stuff. That's quickly summarized. So we're moving on to the physiology of stuff now. Um, if you want the details of this, it can get very detailed very quickly and it can get very confusing. Here's a quick summary of all the formulas you generally need to know. What do I have here? Cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. Mean arterial pressure equals a third of pulse pressure plus diastolic pressure or a third of systolic minus two thirds of diastolic or cardiac output times total peripheral resistance. They'll give you numbers, you just need to work it out. Uh, what, what do I mean by this? The heart rate is changed by the sympathetic system, the parasympathetic system, and the hormones in the blood. So how do you change cardiac output? Change the heart rate. How do you change the heart rate? Change the sympathetic system, change the parasympathetic system, change the hormones in the blood. How do you change stroke volume? Well, stroke volume equals end diastolic volume subtract by end systolic volume. I'll go through what that means later. But the gist of it is that how do you change stroke volume? You change it by changing the preload. You change it by changing the afterload. You change it by changing the contractility of the heart or the inotropy. And that's dependent on sympathetic, 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 venous return, filling time. Uh, total peripheral resistance um, is increased by sympathetic and local factors. I'll go through in a bit, I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, pulse pressure equals systolic pressure subtracted by diastolic pressure and ejection fraction equals uh, stroke volume over end diastolic volume. And you also have flow equals change in pressure over resistance. Any questions so far? So if you just memorize those formulas, you'll be on top of most, you'll probably get 60 to 80% of the questions they might ask for this. So just to go through in a bit more detail, Cardiac output, amount of blood pumped by the heart in one minute, measured in liters per minute, stroke volume times heart rate, determined by, you can change it by altering stroke volume times heart rate, because that's the formula. The heart rate, beats up per minute, um, it's usually, usually controlled by the pacemaker of the heart, known as the sinoatrial node. Uh, know what tachycardia is, know what bradycardia is, but I'm pretty sure that's covered in your ECG lecture. You have an ECG lecture, right? Okay, good. Okay, changing heart rate. Um, change heart rate by increasing the sympathetic drive, decreasing the parasympathetic, or doing the other way uh, to decrease heart rate, and as well as hormones in the blood, such as adrenaline. Stroke volume equals end diastolic volume subtracted by end systolic volume. So end diastolic volume, so diastole is relaxation of the heart. So end diastolic volume, how much blood is in the heart after relaxation? End systolic volume, systolic is ejection or squeezing, so S for squeezing. End systolic volume, how much volume is in the heart after squeezing? Here, this is a representation. So the atria fills it to the ventricles. You get filled up to that much. That's the end diastolic volume. Then the heart contracts. This is about the ventricles. The ventricles contract and eject blood into the system. That's called systole. At the end of systole, that's end systolic volume. Make sense? Any questions? Okay, good. Uh, how do we change stroke volume? Okay, this can get a bit complex. Um, I have lots of notes on how to understand this, but I don't think it's worth understanding this at this late into the year. You might as well just wrote memorize this. I doubt this will come up in a lot of detail, but just a bit is you can change the preload. So the blood in, uh, the blood in the ventricle is prior to the ejection. So the preload, you might as well just assume the preload equals the end diastolic volume. Does it make sense? End diastolic volume, the amount of blood during after relaxation of the heart. Yes, how much blood is in the heart? If you have more blood in the heart prior to ejection, you can eject more blood, hence you increase the stroke volume. The afterload. Afterload is pretty much the pressure inside the body in the aorta. So it's determined by vascular resistance. So basically, if you have higher pressure in the body, the heart has to contract against more pressure. As a result, it can eject less. 
Yeah. And in entrepreneurial and contractility is the ability of the heart to contract. If the heart can contract more, it can um, eject more. That makes sense, right? So there's three, three things to determine. And this is a quick table. Uh, don't learn what raised to or lowered due to, just, remember, just read the bottom part. So preload, increase end diastolic volume, increases stroke volume. Contractility decreases the end systolic volume, increases stroke volume. Afterload increases end diastolic volume, decreases stroke volume. So a bit more details about preload, afterload, and contractility. Preload, degree into which the ventricles are stretched prior to contracting. So that's the, the technical term for it. But for you guys, just assume it's the same as the end diastolic volume. It's easier to think of that way. So the amount of blood inside the ventricles prior to squeezing. So the more blood there is in the ventricles, remember how they talked about the optimal muscle length for contraction? And how if you get a third of the length and a third of the, or what it was, but basically that's the ideal muscle contraction. Basically, more volume inside the heart, the heart can eject more of that volume out. Cool. The uh, afterload is the aortic pressure during systole. So the amount of pressure outside of the heart, in the place where the heart is trying to eject into. And if there's more pressure in there, it makes it for the heart harder for the heart to eject you and therefore decreases the stroke volume. I think that's all you need to take away from that. And the contractility of your heart is basically determined by the sympathetic innervation and basically by the contractile energy of the muscle length. Don't worry too much, but it's basically done by the calcium, by, done by calcium. So ejection fraction, ejection fraction is the amount of blood from the ventricles that is ejected in one, one stroke volume, I guess. So the formula is stroke volume over end diastolic volume. So as you can see here, stroke volume is the amount of heart, uh, amount of the volume inside the left ventricle that you eject into the body, whereas the end diastolic volume is the amount of blood before you eject into the body, and hence you get the fraction between the two. Does it make sense? So pulse pressure, pretty simple. Pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic pressure and the diastolic pressure. That's about it. Uh, mean arterial pressure, uh, there's two, two main formulas for this, or three technically, but two of them equal the same thing. So diastolic plus one third pulse pressure. And if you, if given that pulse pressure equals systolic subtracted by diastolic pressure, you can also get one third systolic plus two thirds diastolic. And it also equals cardiac output times total peripheral resistance. Basically, just the average blood pressure in a person. That makes sense? Um, the concept of blood flow. Okay. So, blood flowing through a vessel is determined by the pressure at the start of the vessel, the end of the vessel, and the resistance throughout the vessel. Hence, you get the formula F equals change in pressure over resistance. That's about it for the, uh, that. Uh, this is the mean arterial pressure, the mean pressure inside the systemic and the pulmonary circulation. I think it's worth memorizing the numbers, just or just realizing that the systemic blood pressure is greater than the pulmonary blood pressure. <laughs> you probably should know a bit, a little bit about laminar and turbulent flow. So basically, if there's nothing obstructing a river, it's very calm and quiet. If you have lots of rocks here and there, it causes rapids and turbulence a turbulence and that causes sound that pops up on so when you're listening to the heart the sounds abnormal sounds you hear is due to abnormal things blocking the heart yeah so if if the valve is calcified for example it goes against like a rock inside a river and it creates a sound that becomes a murmur so this principle is used to determine murmurs i don't think it's very high you're learning about it but it's just there in case um Stenosis and insufficiency. Insufficiency is the same as regurgitation. Stenosis is basically the valve hardens, makes it hard to for systole of the uh, of the previous um, area. So for example, if the atria is trying to eject into the ventricle, stenosis of that vessel would make it difficult for that the blood to enter from the atria to the ventricle. Whereas if the ventricle is trying to eject into the body, stenosis of that vessel there would make it difficult to eject respe respectively. So a mnemonic to easily remember this is pass and pay. So pass, pulmonary and aortic stenosis equals a systolic murmur, so during ejection. Paid, pulmonary aortic insufficiency or regurgitation equals a diastolic murmur. 
I've, and you can sort of, if you really want, you can sort of uh, go backwards and interpret what the tricuspid and mitral uh, stenosis and insufficiency when they will have their murmurs as well, but don't worry too much about it. Changes to resistance. Okay, this they love asking. They love asking what deter, like what is the way you can change the flow of the through a vessel. So the three things that affect the resistance of a vessel is the length. So how long the vessel is, the longer the vessel, the more the, the resistance. The viscosity, so the hematocrit of the blood, so the increase the viscosity, the di more difficult it is for the blood to flow through the body. And the last one is the diameter or the radius. And the thing about the diameter and the radius is that it's inversely proportional as to the power of four. So it has the biggest impact. And if you have to choose between these three, you would want to change the diameter of the vessel to affect its resistance. And in fact, that's what the body does with the arterioles. Because the body can't really change the length of a vessel because you don't really grow your, your blood vessels when you need to increase your resistance. You don't really want to change the composition of your blood. So what you can do is your body does, and what your body act, actually does is change the diameter. So that's how the body uh, changes its resistance and it is the most effective of the three as well. Total peripheral resistance is basically just the resistance in the systemic circulation that the heart must overcome to, to create flow. That's pretty much the gist of it. Um, and you can, you can read the middle part of this to understand why the formula of mean arterial pressure is the same as cardiac output times total peripheral resistance. But the gist of it is the first line and this line called mainly controlled by the resistance of the arterioles. Okay, so to control blood flow, remember how I talked about there's systemic things and there's local things? Well, some of the local things you should know about is active hyperemia, reactive hyperemia, myo, myogenic response to stretch. I think you might have heard this during renal as well. But if not, I'll quickly go through it. So the gist of it is tissues with greater metabolisms will secrete more of certain substances than others, yeah? So if a, a tissue has more metabolism, it will secrete more waste, it has less nutrients. So the body sort of developed a response that if you have more waste, you will dilate the vessels near you. If you have less nutrients, you will dilate the vessels near you. As a result, places with increased metabolism have increased blood flow. So active hyperemia is basically that principle in the body happening. So if, there, if a certain part of the body has an increased metabolism, you get increased blood flow due to the increased amount of waste and decreased amount of nutrients. That's the gist of that. Reactive hyperemia is a bit different. It's when you chuck a blood cuff on someone's arm, you block off the blood circulation, and then when you open the blood, when you undo the blood cuff, blood rushes down the arm and you get a temporary increase in the size of the vessels to allow reperfusion. It's still under the same principles as the previous ones. It's due to a buildup of uh, waste and decreased nutrients, but it's it's a gradual, uh, it's a temporary increase. Whereas a active hyperemia is a gradual increase due to the meta increased metabolism. Does that make sense? Any questions so far? Okay, moving on. So local physical factors is the myogenic response to stretch. So just remember, increase stretch, okay, increase what? So, so, a sudden, so basically, if you get more blood flow to an area suddenly and the body isn't ready for it, it will constrict reactively. That's a gist of it. As you get decreased blood flow, the, the vessel will relax. So for example, the renal arteries, yeah, if you get too much blow, blood flow suddenly through the body, it will constrict to reduce the blood flow to maintain its GFR. That's local myogenic response to stretch. Local temperatures, heat dilates arterioles, cold constricts arterioles. Uh, the endothelium, largest endocrine organ in the body. I think the one hormone they want you to know about is nitric oxide, and that's a vaso, a very, very potent vasodilator. So the endothelium is the same as the tunica intima, it's the most innermost layer of the vessels. And here, nitric oxide. And uh, there's a list of some basic layers, a list of some basic restrictors. Maybe you know about endothelin as well. Those two probably. Uh, more details about nitric oxide. So very, very potent vasodilator. 
have a, has a half life of six seconds. I don't think it's worth learning all about this, but if you do have spare time, just like buzzwords here and there. Nervous regulation of circulation. So it's from the medulla of the body. Now, given that you've done neuroanatomy, I hope you know where this is now, because I'm pretty sure during first year when they, when they talked about the brain and the pons and stuff, you had no idea what's what. But hopefully you realize that now it's from the medullary cardiovascular center. So just to talk about parasympathetic again, only innovates the AB node, only innovates the SA node, only controls heart rate as a result. Does not innovate peripheral vasculature, does not innovate the cardiac muscle of the heart. Oh, except for the penis, which is point and shoot, but no. You know how you know how Helena Parkinson talks about the dual innovation of the penis with the sympathetic and the parasympathetic? Yeah, that's the one exception, I think. Maybe there's one more, but don't worry too much about it. Uh, nervous regulation of circulation. So the sympathetic system innovates the AV, SA node, increases heart rate. Innovates the ventricular muscles, increases contractility. Innovates the arteries and arterioles, can constrict, and as a result, decrease the radius, increase per, uh, peripheral resistance, increases preload because you get increased pressure returning back to the heart. So it's kind of contradictory, but don't worry too much about that. Also has some innovation to veins and venules as well, causing increased venous return. So that's a quick summary. To sense the changes in the heart, the body uses something called stretch or baroreceptors and stretch receptors, and it causes a baroreceptor reflex. So they found in the aortic arch and the carotid sinus. Remember how they tell you not to press too hard on the carotid arteries when you're feeling for them, because you might press in the carotid sinus and induce a false sense of change. So Pretty much the gist of it is if you get increased pressure, you get increased firing of the baroreceptors and you get a baroreceptor reflex. And when the baroreceptor reflex happens, it wants to so, so it wants to decrease the blood pressure. And it wants to go back to equilibrium. So if you get stretched the baroreceptors, it means there's, there's more volume in the in the body, yeah? As a result, the body wants to do the opposite, it wants to reduce the volume. So it activates the nervous system as well as the adrenal glands, et cetera, et cetera. Know about hemorrhage? It's very hard to get your head around. I'm pretty sure you had like these cracks here and there and then strapping people to tables and then tilting them. And But know a little bit about hemorrhage. The gist of it is there's two phases. The first phase, the body tries to compensate. It senses it through its baroreceptors and it tries to compensate with its increasing sympathetic drive, constricting vessels, uh, releasing adrenaline, etc., etc. But eventually, it gets to the point where the body cannot compensate anymore. When it can't compensate anymore, it just gives up. It goes, screw it, we're dead. And then your blood pressure drops dramatically as a result. So you can see here, it's trying, it's trying, it's trying, no, screw it. And then you faint. And then eventually die. Uh, short term regulation of mean arterial pressure. So this is a quick uh, flow chart of the mechanism of stage one of hemorrhage. Go through this, work through it yourself, understand what is happening. A question may or may not come up on this. Um, it's about 50-50, I would say. It's not too hard to get your head around if you know how the, where the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system acts. That's pretty much the gist of it is, sympathetic system increases, parasympathetic system increases, what does it do? Uh, there's the medium term control of mean arterial pressure, mainly adrenaline. But I guess some people consider it as short term, but. And you have your long term control of mean arterial pressure, which is leaning more towards renal physiology with the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Just understand the, the RAS system controls mean arterial pressure as well. Does it make sense? I hope it does. Compliance. So you might have heard of the term compliance before. Compliance applies to vessels. You might have heard of it in the context of the lungs. So in the terms of arteries and veins, the compliance is the ability to hold blood without a large change in pressure. Arteries are not very compliant. I think, I think, I think they're not very compliant. Let me quickly check. Veins are distensible though. Veins are very um, compliant. They can hold a crap ton of blood inside them without much change, so change in pressure. Yeah, so arteries are not very compliant. 
veins are very compliant. So as you can see, the volume is increasing, but there's very little change in pressure. There's very little increase in pressure. Whereas arteries, you increase pressure just a little bit and you get skyrocketing pressure. So veins compared to arteries. So arteries have stiffer walls. As a result, a small increase in the volume results in a large increase in pressure. That's the gist of it. That's compliance. Uh, venous return is the rate of blood flow back to... Oh, yes, question? So you're going back to the compliance. What about the pressure reservoir thing? So the pressure... The reason... Because the pressure reservoir thing basically makes it so the flow throughout the body is continuous. But remember how systolic pressure, you get a massive jump and it decreases during diastole? That's the pressure reservoir effect. But you notice the pressure still increases massively. It's like 50, like if you have blood pressure 120 over 80, that's a 40 pressure difference. Does it make sense? I hope it does. Uh, that, that's the effect, but generally speaking, veins are very compliant, arteries aren't very compliant. You have venous return, know a little bit about venous return. Basically, I think they keep talking about the, what's his name again? Frank Starling and his laws of the heart. And they have these three verses of his poems, but the gist of it is to summarize all three verses, the heart can only pump what it receives. If you don't have flood, blood coming into the heart, it can't pump anything. So factors that determine venous return is the pressure. So to increase venous pressure to the right, <coughs> increase venous pressure, increase venous return. You have the mechanism of the venous valves stopping blood from pulling back into the legs. And you have the skeletal muscle pump and the respiratory pump. So I'll just go through each of uh, each of them a little bit. So the skeletal muscle pump is pretty simple. Basically, you move your muscles, it squeezes blood, the valves make it so it doesn't collapse all the way down, and then you keep, you keep squeezing blood above previous intervals and it comes back to the heart. Does that make sense? The respiratory pump, basically, when you take a deep breath in, does the, the pressure in your chest decreases. The pressure in your chest decreases. Deep breath in. The pressure in your chest decreases. As a result, it makes it easier for blood to flow into the area of decreased pressure because pretty much the principle of all cardiophysiology is stuff from high pressure moves through areas of low pressure. If the, if the lung area has a decrease in pressure, the thorax region has a decrease in pressure, blood flows towards that area more easily. So that's the respiratory pump. Venous pressure is determined by the volume of blood. So more volume of blood, more, more blood that enters the circulation, the more venous return. And this densibility of the, this densibility, or also known as the compliance of the veins. So this also means that venous pressure or venous return is affected by the sympathetic nervous system because sympathetic nervous system increases the, decreases the compliance of the veins so because it constricts them, makes them stiffer like arteries, pushing more blood back to the heart. I hope that makes sense. So here, once again, sympathetic innervation causes constriction of the veins, resulting in altering the compliance. So you get increase in venous return. And that's just a quick flow chart. If you can work through that by yourself, it, you're pretty much on top of the main principles of cardiophysiology. Cardiac function curves. Okay, this is, a, this is annoying to go through. Um, but the gist of it is that blood from, again, blood flows from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. This is talking about pressure, the cardiac function curve is talking about pressure inside the actual heart itself. Yeah. So from the atria to the ventricles. If you get a higher pressure in the atria, it pushes more blood into the ventricles. Does that make sense? Because it contracts, you increase the pressure in the atrial atria and pushes more blood into the ventricles. So that's the cardiac function curve, and it can be changed by the sympathetic nervous system. And you have your venous return curve, which is same principles. Blood flows from an area of high to low pressure, but it's between the um, it's between the pressure It's between the body. If you increase the right atrial pressure, you decrease venous return. Does that make sense? So basically, area of blood wants to flow from an area of high pressure to low pressure. If the end point is the right atrium and the initial point is the veins, if you increase the right atrial pressure, 
you decrease the return because you increase the pressure of the endpoint. Does that make sense? Whereas the initial, the first one was between the right atria and the ventricles. So as a result, you have a contradiction. And the actual, the Frank Starling curve, which is the blood can only pump what it receives, is basically talking about the intersection between those two curves. So that point over here. Because if we assume the cardiac output equals the venous return, you get this curve. Does that make sense? And basically, regardless of whether you increase or decrease, it will eventually try to come to an intersection between the two curves and work through it in your own time. Uh, I talk a little about the sympathetic innovation stimulation and it causes it to move up to here. And I talk a little bit about heart failure and how it moves down here, but I don't think it's very important to get your detail, your head fast about these details. But if you have spare time, go ahead. Uh, cardiac muscle action potentials. Cardiac muscle fibers, they have a similar resting membrane potential to skeletal muscles. They're about, I rest, the resting membrane potential is about 90 millivolts and they depolarize about plus 30. I'm sorry, but you're gonna have to memorize these numbers. Uh, they depolarize for longer. I don't think you have to know about the exact numbers, but they do depolarize for longer. So here you see a cardiac muscle action potential. And there's also something called the excitation contraction coupling, but it, I don't think it's worth fussing with the details about this, but just understand in cardiac action potentials, you, you use excitation contraction coupling, which means that an excitation directly leads to a contraction. And so you can see here, skeletal muscle, very short, but about the same resting membrane potential depolarization. Cardiac muscle lasts for a lot longer and has the plateau phase. You need, you need to memorize this curve. You need to memorize what's happening here, what's happening here, what phase is this called, what phase is this called, what's the refractory period, what's the absolute, what's the relative factor, refractory period. Okay? So why is there a plateau? Why is there a difference between the cardiac and the skeletal muscle? This is mainly due to something called the slow calcium channels during the plateau phase, also known as the L-type calcium channels. I think beyond that, it's, it's not worth knowing. So these are the phases, memorize it, okay? So resting phase is also always, always known as stage four. And here you, you're, you get your sodium channels and calcium channels are closed and you have your rectifier potassium channels just keeping the membrane stable. When you depolarize, you have to know that sodium initially comes in. You have to know this, a rapid influx of sodium. You have your small phase one in which you have a little bit of potassium coming in, and then suddenly the potassium, the calcium balance each other out. The amount coming in is an amount coming out, and that causes a plateau to happen. And then you get your phase three, where the calcium channels close, and your potassium continuously comes in and, and returns it back to the resting membrane potential. Memorize the numbers, memorize what's happening. Don't need to understand it too much. If you memorize it, it's fine. Pacemaker potentials. Pacemaker potentials are different from muscle action potentials. Pacemaker potentials cause the initial stimulus for a contraction. Does it make sense? And the key thing about the pacemaker potentials is they have this automaticity, which means they generate their own current. This is also known as the funny current, or I think it's like IF. So the, the special thing about pacemaker potentials is they have no fast sodium channels. They have a funny current and have voltage-gated calcium channels. The voltage goes from negative 60 to positive 10. I think it's worth learning those numbers as well. It might come up. It has no, technically speaking, it has no resting membrane potential. I guess the lowest it comes is like negative 60. This is just talking about what happens where. So four, zero, three, four. It only has three phases, which is, and they're not even numbered the right. <laughs> So, yeah, there's no phase one or two. So when you open the membrane, so you, you reach down all the way here, the funny current opens. So you see here, the funny current opens and it gradually depolarizes the membrane until it reaches a threshold. Then you get a rapid influx of calcium and then a efflux of potassium and eventually comes back down to where it is and the funny current opens again. That's the gist of it. Um, these are not the phases, these one, two, three, four, they are not the phases, not the phases 
but they correspond with this and this talks to what opens what closes and work through that memorize that and you'll be on top of it okay again another picture showing what's happening so funny current rapid deep influx of calcium outflux of potassium repeat and rinse and repeat so to compare the actual potentials of the three i made um a table so the resting potential of the three what they have so pacemaker doesn't have fast sodium channels only pacemaker has the funny sodium channels uh, the funny current etc etc and this is just comparing the pacemaker and the ventricular action potential so pacemaker cells themselves pacemaker cells come from three main places they are the sa node the AV node and the bundle of his slash the Purkinje fibers. They, as I said before, they generate their own pulse, but they, they, they generate their own pace, but they pace, these three regions pace differently. So the first one is the SA node. Please memorize these numbers, they do come up. We need to memorize what is the rate. So sinus atrial node generates an active potential between 70 to 80 beats. And that it is usually the fastest driver of the heart. It's innovated by parasympathetic and sympathetic. You have your other pacemaker cells, not too, as important, but memorize the numbers once again. The AV node is 40 to 60, and the bundle of his and kidney fibers is 15 to 40. So remember these train pictures they always showed you? Understand these, they, they might come up. So normal conditions, the train driver is the SA node, and that runs about 70 beats per minute. If the SA node breaks down or runs at a slower rate, the AV node takes over and your heart rate drops to 50. If you have an AV node block, the atria contract at 70, so you get the, the atria is desynchronized from the ventricles on the ECG. The ventricles beating at about 30. That's if you see an AV node block. If you're an ectopic or pacemaker, ectopic focus or pacemaker, basically what happens is that one of the one of the carts behind it runs at a faster pace than the SA node and overtakes that pace. It becomes hence an ectopic focus. For example, if the McKinsey fibers in this case runs at 140, it would overtake the SA node. Cardiac cycle. Yes, we're not done yet. Uh, you need to know a little bit, okay, maybe more than a little bit, a moderate amount about the cardiac cycle. You have to know the four phases, phase one to phase one is the filling, phase two is isovolumetric ventricular contraction, phase three is ventricular ejection, phase four isovolumetric ventricular relaxation. You need to know when, what's, where blood is moving to, you need to know what valves are closed when. So I made a neat summary about this. Uh, phase 1A is the passive filling of the ventricles by the atria. So basically, the AV valves are open, blood flows because there's juice flows through, and most of the ventricles is filled at this stage, about 80% of it. Phase 1B, the atria contract and eject that very little bit of extra blood into the ventricles. <coughs> but still part of phase one. Phase two, every time they mention something called ice, where's phase two? There we go. Phase two, every time they mention something called isovolumetric, it means that all the valves are closed. That's pretty easy to remember. Two in phase two and four, isovolumetric, the valves are closed. Basically what happens here is that the pressure in the ventricles gradually is increasing. It overtakes the aorta. But the instant it overtakes the aorta, the valves flip open and you enter phase three, and that's called the ventricular ejection. And during this phase, the ventricles are ejecting blood into the aorta, and the pulmonary, and the right ventricle is ejecting blood into the pulmonary trunk, but we don't really care about the right ventricle that much, so we just mainly focus on that ventricle. Phase four, again, isometric ventricular relaxation. So now the pressure in the aorta is greater than the pressure in the ventricles. The valve, all the valves close and ventricular pressure drops. And here's a handy graph. And it's a bit complex, I agree. It is complex. 
Don't worry about the echocardiogram. Don't worry about the phonocardiogram. Uh, ventricular pressures follow that and follow the, the red one and the when the valves close. Don't follow the atrial pressure. That's talking about the JVP and stuff. <laughs> Don't worry about that. So a quick summary of what happens when what opens, what closes. This is probably worth memorizing, this table. Uh, if you want physiology that actually makes sense in a lot more detail and it's like constructed actually properly, you can refer back to my cardiophysiology VESPA presentation I made last year. It's about 215 slides just on cardiophysiology. So if you have a lot of free time and you really want to know about cardiophysiology, take a look at that. But I, if you want to just pass the bias or do well on the bias, I don't think it's worth putting your time into it. Just learning the stuff I pointed out is good enough. So when people ask about cardiovascular risk factors, they always, it's always usually the five same things over and over again. Hypertension, hyperlipidemia, which is cholesterol, high cholesterol, diabetes, smoking, obesity. If anyone has heart problems, you expect the heart problems, ask these five risk factors. The, the reason why is because most cardiac conditions, most, not all, but most cardiac conditions con are due to something called atherosclerosis. And these are risk factors for atherosclerosis. Other risk factors you can ask about is whether they are male, whether they have a sedentary lifestyle, family history, past history, whether they're old. But those five are the main ones. Because in your year, when you ask, oh, do you, uh, what, what other past history they have, they give it all to you. But in our year onwards, you need to know exactly what you're asking for. When you ask, what past history do you have? They go, I'm not sure. Can you name a few? And you have to list exactly what you want and what you're looking for. So that's just a heads up for that. I think the three main conditions in pathology that you need to know are hypertension, heart failure, and I think stable angina, or and as well as a bit about heart attacks as well. Those are the four main conditions I think you guys should know about. These are the drugs for it. <laughs> I didn't go into much detail because I didn't, I didn't realize that you guys didn't have a pharmacology lecture. Uh, anyway, moving on. Gist of it is know what the definition of hypertension is. Hypertension is a blood pressure, systolic blood pressure greater than 140 or a, systolic, a diastolic blood pressure greater than 90. 90% of the time, it's due to essential hypertension, so it's primary hypertension. It's due to genetics and lifestyle, but other times it can be due to other things, such as pregnancy. That's not con syndrome. It should be, it should be family chromocytoma. Don't worry about that. Uh, the treatment of it, as always, start with lifestyle, smoking, alcohol, diet, exercise, weight loss, education, um, bring in a specialist, bring, um, talk to them about mindfulness, stuff like that, yeah? You can score more points that way. Tre treatment, always the same things. First, ACE inhibitors or ARBs. Yeah, they block the renin angiotensin system. Second, calcium channel blockers. If that doesn't work, add on a thiazide diuretic. And extra points, if they're still resistant to that, you add on more diuretics or alpha blocker, beta, alpha blockers or beta blockers. So I'm not sure whether you guys realize that you can, you're meant to differentiate between the three different diuretics, but the gist of it is thiazide diuretics are used for hypertension. Loop diuretics or furosemide is used for um, heart failure or you want to get rid of fluid very quickly because it's the most effective one. And the last one, spironolactone or aldosterone antagonist is mainly used for, what was it used for? Heart failure, but not getting rid of fluid quickly. It's, main to, it's main, mainly used to treat it. Let's talk about atherosclerosis since everything, almost everything comes to atherosclerosis. So atherosclerosis is pretty much a buildup of cholesterol plaque in the big vessels. Um, if you really have some time, go through each stage of the fit of the pathology of the endothelial dysfunction. But the gist of it is that you get inflammation and endothelial cell dysfunction. You get a buildup of macrophages and LDL. LDL, remember the bad cholesterol. LDL is the bad one. HDL is the good one. And you have the formation of foam cells. This creates fatty streaks inside the arteries. These fatty streaks eventually you get smooth muscle cells moving into the fatty streaks. You get proliferation, you get extracellular matrix deposition, and you get a fibrous plaque that forms. It's a progressive condition. 
and it's the basis of a lot of cardiovascular conditions. If you understand atherosclerosis, you'll be you'll understand all the basis of a lot of the all the other pathologies. So, the complications of atherosclerosis. If atherosclerosis gradually builds up over time, it can block the blood flow through the vessel. This is can be peripheral vascular disease. So if you in, ask for intermittent claudication, do you get pain in your legs when you walk a certain distance? That's due to the vessels being blocked and reduced blood supply. That's due to atherosclerosis. If you get stable angina when you walk a certain distance, you get pain in the heart. That's also due to atherosclerosis. The atherosclerosis plaque can rupture. When it ruptures, the rupture itself doesn't block it. But the thing is that the rupture is very thrombogenic. It causes all it causes a clot to form there. When the clot forms it, that blocks it. When it blocks it, you get an ischemic heart attack. So atherosclerosis causes ischemic heart disease as well. A blood clot can form off a different artery due to a um, atherosclerosis, and it can break off and send off to a different vessel where it lodges itself and causes ischemia to that region. This is caused in the brain, it's called a stroke. In the gut, it's called ischemic gut. In the limb, it's called ischemic limb. In the kidney, it's called kidney infarction. Know the difference between thrombus and bliss infarct. Infarct is death of tissue in a region due to obstruction of the blood supply. Thrombus is a low, uh, a blood clot that forms in the area. Embolus is basically any substance from a different site that lodges at a vessel. So embolus can be a thrombus, but isn't always. It can be bacteria in the blood, such as in infective endocarditis, but don't worry too much about it. One more thing about atherosclerosis, it can form on the abdominal aorta, causing it to weaken causing it to slowly, slowly expand due to hypertension, causing weakness of the wall and rupture, or triple A, as you guys would know. So ischemic heart disease, also known as coronary artery disease and also in other names, due to atherosclerosis, as I just talked about. It is an umbrella term for four conditions, stable angina, and, a, you have, and another umbrella term called acute coronary syndrome. Acute coronary syndrome is a medical emergency. Okay? It consists of three things. It consists of unstable angina, a STEMI, and a non-STEMI. I'm not sure if you guys learned this or not. A little bit? Okay. So the typical presentation, you, you go, I'm having chest pain. You go to them, do, are you having crushing central chest pain, like an elephant sitting in your chest? Does it radiate down to your arm? Does it radiate to your jaw? <laughs> Have, do you feel very sweaty, cold, clammy? That's due to overactivation of the sympathetic nervous system. I, do you feel like nausea, vomit? No, do you feel nauseous and do you feel like vomiting? Do you have difficulty breathing? Did you feel like fainting? Do you feel dizzy? Did you actually faint? So quickly talking about the actual terms themselves. Stable angina is basically gradual stenosis of the coronary arteries due to atherosclerosis. It only becomes symptomatic after 70% of the blood has been blocked, usually. That's the number that's been agreed on. And it's predictable chest pain that comes on with exercise, alleviated with rest and nitrates. It usually lasts less than 20 minutes and always comes on in the same conditions. It can be progressive over time. Um, the treatment for it, you can give them beta blockers. You give them statins, you can give them PRN, which is like on-demand nitrates when they get the chest pain. Unstable angina is pretty much what I talked about with the rupture of the atherosclerotic plaque. But it doesn't completely block the artery off. It causes a transient sort of block and doesn't cause any ischemia. As a result, it sort of causes, it, it's sort of an in-between between the worst case scenario and stable angina. It makes it so your chest pain comes on randomly. You don't, you can't predict when. It comes on at rest. It comes on at night, wakes you up, but it's still alleviated with nitrates. Not always alleviated at rest, though. Not always. Sometimes can be alleviated. Not always alleviated. I should probably should change that. It's part of acute coronary syndrome. And one more thing, I'm not sure if you guys know about this, but cardiac biomarkers are a sign of cardiac death, not ischemia, but actual death. <laughs> Because basically, when a cell dies, it releases its contents into the blood. In the term, in the case of cardiac muscle, 
one thing that differentiates cardiac muscle from the rest of the body is that it has something called troponin in it, which is usually uh, has something called troponin in it. And if cardiac muscle cells die, the troponin uh, the cell breaks down, releases this chemical inside the cardiac muscle into the blood. It's the cardiac biomarkers. So you have end STEMI and STEMI. You can even differentiate this. You differentiate this through an ECG. So an NSTEMI and a STEMI is pretty much the same pathophysiology. You get a rupture in the atherosclerotic plaque, which results in an occlusion of the artery. As a result, you get you get a infarct, MI, MI myocardial infarction, cardi myocardial death. However, in the NSTEMI case, it's something called a subendocardial infarct. What does it mean by this? It means that Potentially, the blood clot didn't last that long and only this area died off, but before this area could die off, it was perfused again. But don't worry too much about that if that's confusing. If, just memorize that in STEMI, ST depression or ST changes or no ST elevation. No ST elevation and raised cardiac biomarkers is an in STEMI. So non-ST elevated myocardial infarction. Myocardial infarction, tissue has died, therefore you get raised troponins. STEMI, ST elevated myocardial infarction. Myocardial infarction, tissues have died, hence you have troponins, you have raised cardiac biomarkers, you get ST elevation, hence you have the ST elevation part of the STEMI. <laughs> ST elevation. <laughs> ST elevation is usually a transmural, means it's through the whole, it's the whole thickness of the muscle depth. So managing ischemic heart disease. I'm not sure how much you guys actually need to know about this. I'm not sure how much it's actually taught because I don't, honestly, I didn't learn any of this in second year. I learned all of this in third year. But the gist of it is you always do an ECG first and you always try to get cardiac biomarkers to stratify what is the condition. Is it a myocardial infarction? Is it just unstable angina? That's what you want to figure out. Other things you can do is echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the heart, coronary angiogram where you sort of snake a camera into, uh, which injects dye into the heart and you see the blockages of the vessels. But don't worry too much about that. The management of ischemic heart disease is through a mnemonic called MONASH. So it's morphine, oxygen, nitrates, aspirin, statins, heparin. You might see a little bit of difference between the S's here and there. Some people say streptokinase, some people add extra stuff like monobash, which is adding on beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. But the first line treatment for a STEMI, not an NSTEMI, first line treatment for a STEMI is a PCI or percutaneous intervention. Basically, you go to the blood clot, you bust it open physically. That's it. Uh, thrombolysis only in a STEMI. Thrombolysis is basically if you can't bust the clot open, you just hope you give them uh, drugs which try to break the clot down. That's about it. Heart failure. The heart failure is a very, very broad condition that you will learn about next year in all its glorious detail. But for the moment, you can you only need to focus on a few select details that are important. First, heart failure is the heart cannot meet its function. The function of the heart is to supply cardiac output to the body. So if there's not enough cardiac output by the heart into the body, you have heart failure. There's many causes of heart failure. The main one that you should know is ischemic heart disease, cardiomyopathy, which the muscles of the heart grow and it can't contract as well, or you have hypertension in which it makes the heart can't pump into it, or you have valvular diseases which causes problems with the heart. But the patient, this is the key presentation. Remember how you always ask about oh, difficulty of breathing? Do you, have par do you wake up at night gasping for breath? How many pillows do you sleep on? Because these are the three key questions in heart failure, or at least left-sided heart failure. Because you don't have to differentiate this now, but there's left and right-sided heart failure, they have different symptoms. Just a bit is, you ask these three questions for heart failure, yeah? So this is a little bit of clinical stuff as well. You get cough, you can get a cough, and you can get something called pink frothy sputum. If you ever hear that buzzword pop up, it's heart failure, just go heart failure. Every single time. If in, a, in an OSCE, if you suspect it's heart failure in third year, you can ask them about pink frothy sputum. 
Uh, peripheral edema, so basically the heart can pump as much, so you get backlogging of fluid into the legs, you get backlogging of fluid into the stomach called ascites, and you get uh, hepatomegaly, so you get backlogging of fluid into the liver, and you can even get a tender liver, or at least a fluid-filled liver. You get a raised JVP, which includes that you have a raised fluid state. Does that make sense? The treatment, or oh, the investigations, um, there's a lot of investigations you can do for heart failure, but the specific ones for heart failure is BNP, or brain natriuretic peptide, which doesn't make much sense, but take it as it is. And you have an echocardiogram, which basically is an ultrasound of the heart to see what's wrong with the heart. The management, same as always, lifestyle, smoking, alcohol, diet, exercise, weight loss, education. Um, in specific to cardiac heart failure, you might want to talk about fluid restriction, salt restriction, daily weight, because your weight will fluctuate depending on how much fluid you're um, retaining. Like if a patient comes in and say, oh, I gained three kilos yesterday, it's probably not because they ate a lot, it's probably because they're retaining three liters of fluid. In terms of pharmacological drugs, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, spironolactone, which is also an aldosterone antagonist. These three drugs are the increase, or decrease the mortality and morbidity of the condition. There's also one more drug which does it, but you don't have to know at your year level. But those three drugs treat, actually treat heart failure. Yeah? Fruzamide, you only do it if the patient's fluid overloaded. If they have too much fluid in their lungs, for example, and they can't breathe, you give them fruzamide to flush all the fluid out. So fruzamide is sort of a panic button when there's too much fluid. It does not increase, uh, there's no benefit to mortality. There's also surgical management because if you have heart failure, your heart can is prone to arrhythmias, so you might need a pacemaker to pace the heart properly. You might have a defibrillator if you keep going to arrest. You might need a heart transplant. Infective endocarditis. Infective endocarditis is a condition which so endocarditis is the endocardium is the inner layer of the heart, which covers the inner walls of the heart and the valves of the heart. Endocarditis is inflammation. Infective means that there's an infective source. The infective source is usually a bacteria. So risk factors for infective endocarditis is having a prosthetic heart valve or having heart valve problems because infective endocarditis tends to affect the valves. The symptoms of it is fever, chills, rigors, night sweats. You should, you should have this down pat. You should have every time a patient is suspected with an infection, it goes fever, chills, rigors, night sweats. And you can go loss of appetite, weight loss, fatigue. Signs that you might see, you might hear these funny things you see in the hand and such, they're called, you might hear a new murmur. It's basically, if, if the infective endocarditis is on the valve itself, it will cause the, the blood flow through the valve to be different. It will cause the blood flow through the valve to be turbulent. As a result, you get a murmur, which is an abnormal sound. Does that make sense? Other than that, you might get Osler's nose Janeway lesions. Remember the difference between Osler's nodes and Janeway lesions. I wrote it down there, I highlighted it as well. Osler's nodes, O for owl, so they hurt. They're painful, immune complexes. They're made of immune complexes. And they're in the fingertips. Janeway lesions are septic emboli deposits and they're non-tender and they're in the palms. Those are the differences between Osler's nodes and Janeway lesions. I think that's worth knowing the difference between. Other things you might see are splinter hemorrhages, roth spots. Roth spots are in the eyes. I don't think you need to know at your level, but pretty much it's just in the eyes. And you might get signs of peripheral emboli. So remember how I talked about how emboli can be not just from blood clots, it can also be from bacteria. This is the case with bacteria, where the bacteria will lodge off and block a vessel. So how do you treat this? Well, you treat the infection. That's about it. Pericarditis is just inflammation of the pericardium. The pericardium is the sac around the heart. The most common cause is viral, but you can also have a lot of other causes. The history is classic. You have a sharp, stabbing chest pain, worse on inspiration and leaning back, better on leaning forward. Why is this? Because when you are leaning back or when you're inspirating, the heart, the very tender layer around the heart is all inflamed and it touches against the region around it and it causes it 
a lot of pain. Whereas if you lean forward, the heart leans away from the other vessels around it. Does that make sense? So remember the sharp stabbing chest pain was an inspiration leading back better on leaning forward. The signs you would see is a pericardial rub. What is a pericardial rub? It's as if two layers are rubbing against each other. The treatment of it is you treat the underlying cause of it, you give them NSAIDs, NSAIDs are for pain, and you give them colchicine, which is kind of strange because that's a drug for gout. Don't worry about that. They found it in a study that it works. So that's good enough. So cardiac effusion and tamponade. So these cardiac effusion itself is not an emergency, but cardiac tamponade definitely is. Effusion is basically fluid in an area. Cardiac effusion would be fluid inside the pericardial cavity. So remember the layers of the pericardium and the pericardial cavity? There's fluid in there. And it causes symptoms similar to pericarditis because it irritates the pericardium. So sharp stabbing chest pain, better leaning forward, worse leaning back, and breathing in. Cardiac tamponade is defined as fluid in the pericardial cavity greater than 100 milliliters. I'm not sure if you guys need to learn this. Yeah, it's been covered. It's been covered? Well, it's been mentioned before. Okay, no reason. Greater than 100 mils in the pericardial cavity, and as a result, it compresses the heart. The heart physically is being compressed. Increased pressure in the heart means that you get decreased venous return. You get decreased venous return, you get decreased cardiac output. Your heart will go into, if you, you get basically, you can't pump enough blood in, not enough blood is coming in, not enough blood is coming out, and it's a medical emergency. You get something called Bex triad. I'm not sure whether you need to memorize it this year or not, but definitely next year, it's worth knowing. You get muffled heart sounds due to this thick layer of fluid surrounding the heart, so you can't hear the sounds properly. You get a pulses paradoxus, which is a lot, usually when you take a deep breath in, you get some decrease in systolic blood pressure, but in, in cardiac tamponade, you get a massive decrease. I think it's greater than 10 or 20 systolic blood pressure. Check me up on that. And you get a raised JVP. The, the emergency treatment for cardiac tamponade. Oh, no, there's a lot of fluid inside the pericardial cavity. What do we do? We take the fluid out. Problem solved. Um, so that concludes the pathology. So a few tips. One of the best resources I've seen for first and second year that I didn't actually have until I reached third year, sadly, is something called the first aid for UMSLE step one. I would recommend somehow finding that and using that. It's amazing. It's more detailed than you need in some areas. But for anything that you want, I want a very concise summary about, it has it. Spot on right there. Do every question you can grab your hands on. Practice exams are one of the best ways to learn. <laughs> and doing any questions, like questions you guys make for each other, questions past years have made for later years, doing any questions you can find your hands on will help re make you realize where you are weak and where you can improve and what to learn. So it will direct your learning in the last five or so weeks you have left. At this point in time, it's very hard to go and relearn all the physiology or relearn all the concepts and such. Hence, that's why I'm emphasizing a lot on um, rote memorizing. I would normally, in normal circumstances, I wouldn't support it, but desperate times, desperate measures. If you put in the time and effort from now on, I guarantee almost indefinitely that you will pass. If you put time and effort in, you'll almost indefinitely pass the bias. It's very difficult to fail the bias. Of course, if you don't attend enough during the year, you can technically still fail second year, so there's that. And one more thing you need to understand is that being a good medical student does not make you a good doctor. There's a difference between the two, and you'll realize that in third year. And last thing is, don't be afraid to have questions. If you have any questions about my lecture or anything like that, or in general about mo any topics, I will have a good crack at it if I can. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I have a few questions if you really want to go through them, but all the answers and stuff are on the slides. So you can go through them now or later if you want. Okay. Now or later? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, the people you can you want to can leave if they want to leave because the questions are up. But I can go through the questions if you want. They're yeah, pretty much the stuff I covered that I think would be important, or the stuff I mentioned or heavily emphasized inside my slides. 
Thank you. All right, thanks for coming. Good luck. <laughs> okay, I'll quickly go through this. So, when did the coronary arteries fill? Diastole, yes. What drug will prolong the filling time? Beta blockers. Beta blockers slow the heart rate. If you slow the heart rate, you get a longer diastole. That kind of makes sense. Uh, I wasn't very good at math, so I made this relatively easy. So these this might this, these questions come up. Just pretty much memorize the formulas, apply the formulas. That's pretty much how it works. <laughs> They almost always will give you questions with whole numbers because they, you guys don't get a calculator. Five, four, three, two, one. Should be which of the following has the greatest effect on the resistance of the art? Oh my god, what am I saying? The radius, pretty much. So remember the key concepts I emphasize. I feel are the most important. Greatest drop in blood pressure. Arterials. Arterials, yes. Oh wait, what? <laughs> Guys, I, I messed up, it's arterials. My bad. Change that if you can. Uh, warn people about this slide as well. This is a trap. Um, supply to what determines the dominant coronary vessel of the heart? Yes, posterior IV septum, because the posterior descending artery supplies the posterior IV septum. That's the detail. You might they might try to, you know, add an extra layer of depth to the question. So thank you very much for listening. That's good to my presentation. If you have any questions at all, feel free to come up. I'll be waiting around for about 10, 15 minutes. Oh no, you got it pretty well. And during about fun, we had like 